this is Josh here at the Heart Village and today for this video we're going to discuss um, some ideas and concepts surrounding our growing season of vegetables here in Florida. This is one of the most common questions we get um, in tours and stuff is kind of when is it appropriate to plant different things? How do I know when to plant what? And some people may have seen different charts and are just wondering how do I know what to plant? So to start, um, when we're talking about planting times, we're really talking about, uh, right now, annual vegetables. So those are crops that live for one season, and those are our grocery store vegetable type items. So we're talking about tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, beans, carrots, cabbage. Those are the types of crops I'm talking about when I say annual vegetables. And so part of understanding um, the seasons in Florida and when to plant what is, is you know, trying to get a good grasp on the type of climate we live in and matching the best time of the year to match the needs of a specific crop. And so one important principle of growing organically is to try to place plants into the time of year when they're most happy because if you try to push things into a time when say it's too hot and humid, that invites all kinds of pests and diseases to attack a plant. It might do perfectly fine without any pest or disease problems at a different time of year. So our climate is a humid subtropical climate. So what that means is that um, we have fairly high rainfall in our wet season. We have a wet season and a dry season, but even if there's not high rainfall, we have high humidity. Um, for most of the year and then it's a subtropical climate so that means that we have prevailing conditions that are similar to the tropics for a good portion of the year say seven eight months and then we have a window of the year that's cool so it's not cold like the more continental weather patterns of most of the united states it's a cool season so we could have nights that get down into the 20s but typically our nights are in the 30s, 40s, 50s, or even 60s. So those are the months of November, and then really the cool sets in December, January, February, with the bulk of the really freezing weather and the frost happening in January. Then in May, the weather gets really hot and the rainy season starts somewhere in between May and June. And then we have that kind of rainforest, hot humidity going from May, to June into really September. So this is an important thing to understand is that most vegetables really, most vegetables that we're familiar with eating in our culture, I should say, really don't grow well in that hot, humid, rainy season. A lot of our cuisine in the United States comes out of European type cultures where it's the weather's a lot cooler and so most of the vegetables that come from that kind of climate aren't well suited to tropical places. Now we do have some tropical vegetables in our cuisine that grow well in the rainy season. Those would be eggplant and okra. Um, but really other than that, most of the stuff you're gonna find in a grocery store that's a vegetable is not super well suited to that season. Um, so what that leaves us with is basically September to May is the time of year in Florida where we can grow those types of vegetables. It's a long window and you can kind of divide that up into two shoulder seasons, the fall and the spring. Because for a lot of us, if we're in North or Central Florida, we also have to deal with frost and freezes. So the way our farm looks, because we deal with frost and freezes, is we have a big planting of cold sensitive vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers that happens in September and then another planting of that stuff that happens in March. Um, during that whole period we can be planting all those plants that tolerate frost in cold weather. So really when we start talking November through March we're looking in a big way at all the brassica plants so that's kohlrabi, cabbage, kale, cauliflower, turnips, radishes, cabbage, anything in that group, um, lettuce, carrots, 
onions, strawberries, which is a fruit that you grow in a vegetable garden. Um, those are the main ones that are coming to my head right now. Um, and then again, in the spring, we go back into some of the warmer season stuff, tomatoes, cucumbers, whatever. If you live in a frost-free area of Florida, you can grow tomatoes and peppers straight through the winter time with no problem. And if you have some sort of way to protect your plants with a greenhouse or a high tunnel, you can also grow tomatoes and eggplants and peppers straight through the winter time. Um, but what I wanted to show today was our specific system we use to kind of fill out the whole year so that we're growing in a way where we're using these beds to the best of our ability to use every inch of it for every day of the year. Because these types of raised beds were very um, time consuming and put in a lot of resources to invest in these. So we wanna be able to use them. It doesn't make a lot of sense for us to just throw up our hands and say we can't grow anything for the summer and just kind of give up. And so that's one thing. But another problem we have is that if we left these beds empty over the summer, we'll have an infestation of weeds. And particularly this weed right here is called nut sedge. This proliferates underground. They're all connected and there's little tubers underneath. And um, if you just let this spread through the whole rainy season with no cover, then the entire growing season for vegetables, you're fighting this nut sedge, which is a you know waste of time and energy. What we've learned about this weed is it really doesn't thrive in shade. So you need some sort of crop covering the bed in the meantime. So what we've come up with is a system where we grow vegetables for roughly eight months in these beds, and then we switch to growing sweet potato for the summer. This lines up with our academic calendar, but it also makes a lot of sense just for vegetable growing, even if we weren't running on an academic calendar. So let's go over to this bed, and we're gonna look at sweet potato, and I'm gonna kind of discuss what that does for us um, in the hot, rainy season. All right, so we're here in the sweet potato garden, and the beds that you just saw a second ago, which were planted to green beans and tomatoes, just eight weeks ago looked just like this with sweet potato. So right now we're in the process of slowly pulling out all the sweet potato, and then we, that same day when we pull it off, we transition right into a new crop. So we kind of are slowly picking at these beds and turning them over. Um, but here's a potato, so I'll pull it up just to show. Um, we get really good production out of this sweet potato beds in about 120 days, which is the length of time we need from May to September when there's nobody here really taking care of our gardens too much. And when we, it's really too hot, we don't really wanna be out here weeding and things like that. But we also wanna get uh, something to eat out of the garden. So sweet potato is just, it's really perfect for this because it totally, covers the bed and it chokes out all the weeds. It protects the soil from the sun. So it's really working kind of double time. It's, it's choking out all the weeds and doing all those other things, but at the same time growing something that we wanna eat. So when September rolls around, which now it's coming up on November and we haven't got to these yet, but September, October, we start to get in here and pull these out. We can, we can get, a hundred or probably even 150 or even more, maybe on a really, if everything was perfect, pounds out of a 40 foot bed like this. And then uh, we pull all the vines off and those can be composted to get returned back to the garden at a later time. So we're not w wasting those nutrients or fed. We actually feed a lot of the vines to our animals. Um, and then we're right back into growing vegetables. So it's kind of an all year growing system there's no day of the year that's being wasted in nothing being grown. So this is serving as a cover crop and as a food crop at the same time. So I think this is a really good uh, system that a lot of people even in their home gardens could um, employ. Now one problem we do have is that we have a pest here called sweet potato weevil that uh, gets into the potatoes. It makes them unmarketable. You can still cut out the bad spots for at home but the weevils tunnel all through and if you don't eat them fast enough, they go bad faster. So that's a real problem. And the real way to beat this pest is by rotating it to new areas every year. 
and this system forces us to use the same bed every year. So it's hard for us to get away from these sweet potato weevils, which there's actually some holes at the top of this one. Um, another crop that we can grow in basically the same way is taro. Um, so the taro actually yields even more than the sweet potato. These are really small bulbs that just happen to be sitting here, but the center uh, bulb can get about that big on taro. And we get five, six, or even seven pounds per plant on these. And both the sweet potato and the taro we space the same way, which is that they're two feet apart here, and then another row two feet apart on that side in a triangulated pattern. So it's kind of like footsteps. There's one here, one here, one here, one here, right down the bed. So there'll be sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes, kind of a zigzag pattern. And the taro also is pretty good at choking out weeds and shading the ground. Not quite as effective, but it does, it does work. And the taro takes more like six months. So it's not quite as tight of a cycle as the sweet potato is. So there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, to me, sweet potato is definitely the optimal plant to use um, for this. So what could happen, just to give a picture here, these are really beat up, disease, pest ridden vines. That's normal for this time of year because these are ready to get out of here. What's gonna happen in the next week or two is this will all get dug up. We'll store the sweet potatoes inside. The vines will go to the animals. We'll kind of work on this bed and then we could come in right in here and plant cabbage. Um, so that's the basics of the system. Okay, so you, you saw there kind of like a before phase and now we're in the after. So these beds are what happens after the sweet potato comes out. They're mostly free of not sedge and we add amendments and we add mulch and then we go into plants. So this is a tomato crop and this bean crop and these will be mostly done and sometime in December when we get a frost and then these will be immediately followed by say a broccoli crop or something cold tolerant because that's our time when we're in frost and freeze uh, risk. And then that'll come out and go right back to sweet potato. So there's kind of a cycle to it. Something else I wanted to touch on was direct seeding and transplanting. Um, there's a lot of questions you get about which to use. Um, I wanna recommend everybody both for timing of planting and direct seeding versus transplanting. If you pull up the um, Orange County planting guide that gives you a crude um, idea on each crop of kind of what weather conditions it tolerates, when to plant, also how easily it transplants or if you should direct seed. There's some little things on there I might disagree with a little bit for our particular property. We might go earlier or later or whatnot, but it's pretty much a good document to source from. I also wanted to talk a little bit about these transplants and direct seeding and how they play into it. Since we're trying to do these tight rotations, um, transplants can really be a good tool because um, when you pull out a flat of transplants, these are already five weeks old. So if I were to put seeds in the ground today, it's five weeks until these catch up, until those seeds would catch up. So if I pull this tomato crop out, I could put this in the same day and I already have plants that are five weeks old, but I haven't wasted that five weeks in the bed. So it's the most efficient use of the bed. We're able to grow the beginnings of a crop off to the side in a nursery and at the same time um, be growing a crop in the bed rather than waiting all that time for seeds to get going. Some plants though don't do well um, from transplanting, carrots 
are one. Any bean family plant typically doesn't do well from transplanting or it's not practical to transplant. But as a general rule, a lot of our major vegetables we transplant. If we can, we pretty much do. All the brassicas, lettuce, tomatoes, anything in the Solanaceae group, that's um, eggplant, pepper, tomato, um, all those kinds of plants transplant very well. So the tomatoes you see here, these were all transplants. The beans here, these were all direct seeded. So you see two different kinds of systems there. So I hope this video is helpful in kind of looking at a big picture of what a year looks like in a vegetable garden. And this is just one growing system that, you know, uh, this is what we use. And hopefully you can incorporate some of these concepts into your own gardens in Florida. So well, thanks a lot for watching.